Uh, thank you, Benoit. Uh, so my name, as already said, is Marco Bayer, and my role in the uh, values project is how Olaf called it, to tell the story. And my story is the story on pollination, particularly for Luxembourg. How do I pause? On? <laughs> Enter. Okay, I got it. No problem. Um, so I will also go a little bit like like Roloff did from the global level to the to the local level. Uh, globally speaking, pollination is an ecosystem service with an estimated annual global value of about 153 billion US dollars. This is an estimate from the year 2009. There is still a debate going on. Those estimates change over time. But just to give you a rough idea how important it is on a global level, um, pollination can be provided basically by two ways. One of them is wind, and the other one is insects. Uh, we will not talk about wind here. So when we talk about uh, pollination, we are talking about uh, pollination that is provided by insects. And uh, in that domain, you can again distinguish between two functionally important groups. One of them is the managed pollinators, such as honeybees or bumblebees. <coughs> Those managed pollinators can, in fact, be purchased. So you can buy a colony of bees or you can buy a colony of bumblebees. And then on the other hand, we have wild pollinators, such as solitary bees. They are usually not traded. They occur in, in, uh, in, the, in the nature, and uh, it's a little bit more tricky. They can live uh, solitary, not in colonies. And when we go to the, to the managed um, pollinators, we know that it's few species, which is easy to handle and easy to model. The number of colonies is known. Uh, the number of uh, individuals per colony is known. So in an average bee colony, you may have like 40,000 bees. Uh, and the spatial distribution of the, of the managed pollinators is known. So we have very good information on the managed pollinators, particularly in Luxembourg. For the wild pollinators, the situation is a little bit different. There we have many species. Uh, in 2000, no, in 1995, there were 274 species counted for Luxembourg, which is quite a lot. Their relative abundance is unknown. That, we, that means we do not know exactly the composition of those species. And their spatial distribution is also known. So in a nutshell, we have very good information on the managed pollinators, but pretty vague information on the wild pollinators. What can we do about that? There is actually an approach uh, that was published by Zulian et al. in the year 2013, taking advantage of the fact that all of those wild bees need very specific, uh, they have very uh, specific requirements for nesting. So some of them are nesting in small caves in the soil. Some of them need those tubes uh, for laying their eggs. And some of them need really trees or caves and trees to build their nests. And with these, um, with these, um, landscape characteristics, Zulian et al. developed an approach, a relative po pollination potential index that you can see here mapped for Europe. So you see the, the more you come to the north, the, dark, the, the more it gets red. And red means uh, not many nesting opportunities and in turn uh, re low relative pollination potential. So this is a proxy that can, for instance, be used if we do not have really detailed information on the on the uh, insect counts. Another detail that is uh, of relevance is that the pollination efficiency differs between the species. In this graph, we have put the honeybees on the left-hand side to one, uh, relative efficiency one. And you see wild insects uh, are, on average, twice as efficient as honeybees in pollination. Bombus species queens are drena species four times as effective as honeybees. And the champion is Osmia cornuta, an apple. It's five times as efficient in pollinating like honeybees. Another thing that needs to be considered is which crops are really relevant in a specific region or which crops are really dependent upon pollination. And for Luxembourg, we have identified two uh, major crops that, uh, that respond positively to insect pollination. One of them is rapeseed on the left-hand side. Uh, rapeseed does not really need insect pollination, but you have additional yield when you have insect pollination. And on average, it's about 12%. Might not seem much, but it is, because the oilseed rape uh, area is quite large. 12% is, is a good uh, add-on. 
For apple, apple really depends upon pollination very strongly. Without pollination, uh, you have hardly any apple, but with pollination, you have a plus of 650%. So apple is really very much dependent on apple. Um, uh, apple is very much dependent on pollination. Now let's have a look at uh, some spatial aspects. On the left-hand side, on the left map, you see the hotspots of managed honeybee colonies. So you have basically hotspots here uh, where there are many honeybees. And on the middle, you can see the oilseed rape. And you can see that there is quite a good match between oilseed rape and honeybees in this region. Then we have also a honeybee hotspot here in the south and again a hotspot here for oilseed rape, but here in the north you see uh, little honeybees, but lots of oilseed rape. So sometimes there is a good match between this crop and and uh, uh, and poll uh, pollinators, managed pollinators, but sometimes it's also not. And on the right hand side you see the hotspots for fruit orchards. There are basically these three hotspots. This is by far the most important one in the community of Steinsel, north of Luxembourg City, where primarily apple is grown. And you can see also here a little hotspot of, uh, of managed honeybees. So in a nutshell, um, the managers of bees are doing what the bees themselves would probably also do. They follow to some extent the interesting crops. Okay, and now I think it's, it's, yeah, it's Miriam's term to give you the story outline of carbon sequestration. Thank you. <laughs>